Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video based on everything you need to know for ionic bonding. The first thing to remember is that ionic bonding involves a metal and a non-metal. And the metal always will transfer electrons to a non-metal. So for example, I've got a metal here which has one electron in the outer shell, which means it's in group one. It wants to lose that one electron. It's easier to lose it. The element on the right has got seven electrons in the outer shell. It's a non-metal, therefore it's easier for it to gain one electron. So what will happen in ionic bonding is the metal will give its electrons or transfer them to the non-metal. And as a result of that, you end up with charged particles. These charged particles are called ions, which are atoms that have gained or lost electrons. Metals are always positive and non-metals are always negative. Now the definition for ionic bonding is the strong electrostatic attraction between an anion and a cation. An anion is a negative ion, try and remember that, and your cation, think cat, pause, positive. Now there is an easy way to work out the charge of all of your cations and anions, and to do that, what you want to do is have a look at how many electrons there are in the outer shell. So we're gonna have a look at groups one, two, three, five, six, and seven. We're not going to include group four because you won't be asked that in the exam. And we're gonna have a look at the electrons in the outer shell, which you should remember is exactly the same. So what you need to now be able to do is figure out whether they need to gain or lose electrons and how many. So if it's in group one, it's easier to lose one electron. Group two, easier to lose two. Group three, easier to lose three. Then group five, it's easier to gain three. Group six, it's easier to gain two. And group seven, it's easier to gain one. So for groups one, two, and three, which are losing electrons, they are losing negative electrons, so they become positive. So all metals make positive cations. And all non-metals are gaining negative electrons, so they become negative overall. Once you've known that, the charge is easy. So if it's group one, plus one. Group two, two plus. Group three, three plus. Group five, three minus, because you've got three negative electrons added. Group six, two minus, two negative electrons added. And group seven, one minus. So for example, aluminium is in group three, it loses three negative electrons and becomes Al3+. Sulfur is in group six, gains two negative electrons and becomes S2-. The next thing you need to be able to do in ionic bonding is to be able to draw it and to be able to draw dot and cross diagrams. So we're gonna have a look at the reaction between aluminium and chlorine. Aluminium is a metal, so it loses electrons. Chlorine is a non-metal, so it gains electrons. Therefore, we know it's ionic. So what we need to do now is draw out the outer shells of our elements. So as we said, aluminium is in group three. I put three electrons in the outer shell. Chlorine is in group seven. I put seven electrons in the outer shell. Now I've done one as dot, one as crosses, so you know where the electrons have come from. Now, what you have to do here is you need to transfer as many electrons from the metal to the non-metal as possible. Remembering you can only go up to a maximum of eight. So you can see I can only move one electron across to my chlorine atom. Now that chlorine atom is complete. I can show that by drawing it on the right hand side, putting a bracket around it and putting my negative charge. However, aluminium still needs to lose two electrons. So the way to do that is you add another chlorine in, as you can see here. So we then transfer the next electron over to my next chlorine atom. Chlorine is now full, so I can move that over to the right hand side and add another chlorine atom to get rid of my final electron. So my final ionic configuration will look like this. It's really important to put the brackets around, to put the charges in, and to show what it was like before and what it's like afterwards. Now, as we can see here, I've got one aluminium, I've got three chlorines, so I know my formula is AlCl3. I've gone through that quite quickly. If you're not sure, if you want more examples, have a look at my video in the playlist in the top right-hand side. Now, there's an easier way of finding the formula of ionic compounds, 
As long as you can work out the charge, it's really, really straightforward. So the first thing, you have to work out the charge. Remember, group one, two, three, five, six, seven, charges become plus one, plus two, plus three, three minus, two minus, one minus. So now you know the charge for any element in the periodic table that's in group one, two, three, five, six, or seven. Now, if you get a transition metal, they will usually tell you the charge. They might give you it in brackets in the formula or the name. So for example, Cu2SO4 with the two in brackets tells you the charge is Cu2+. You also need to remember the polyatomic ions. So that's SO4 2 minus for your sulfate, OH minus for your hydroxide, NH4 plus for your ammonium, NO3 minus for your nitrate, and CO3 2 minus for your carbonate. Once you've got that, it's nice and easy to work out the formula. So for example, if we go with aluminium and oxygen reacting together to make aluminium oxide, aluminium is in group three, and oxygen is in group six. So aluminium is gonna be Al3 plus, and oxygen is gonna be O2 minus. So that's the first step. Step two, swap the numbers. So get rid of the charge, swap the numbers, and then make them subscript. Now it's important to choose the numbers from the top, nothing from down at the bottom, especially if you have polyatomic ions. So if we have a look at aluminium and oxygen, I've got my three plus at the top, so I'm gonna take that three and I'm gonna put it down here. And then my two minus, I'm gonna take that two and I'm gonna put it down here. So my formula becomes Al2O3. Now there are a few exceptions. If the charges are already the same, so you've got two plus, two minus, or one plus, one minus, do nothing. So for example, Na plus and Cl minus, the charges are the same, you do nothing, so it's just NaCl. And then the second thing, if you have a polyatomic ion, you must put a bracket around it if you are doubling it. So for example, aluminium reacting with a hydroxide, aluminium is three plus, hydroxide as you can see up here is OH minus, I take the number at the top, I move it down to the bottom, but because I've now got three OH minus polyatomic ions, I must put a bracket around to show I've got three of everything. Another example, ammonium, NH4 plus, reacting with a carbonate, CO3 two minus. I take my two from the top right, I move it down to the bottom left. I've now got a two next to my four. It looks weird, so I have to put a bracket there. So it's NH4 in brackets, two, CO3. The final part of the ionic bonding section is the properties. Now, nice and simply, ionic compounds have high melting points. They cannot conduct electricity when solid, but they can when they are molten or dissolved or aqueous. And the explanation for all three of those is all linked to the definition of the bond, which is the strong electrostatic attraction between your anion and cation. So why do they have high melting points? There's a strong electrostatic attraction between the anion and cation. Therefore, lots of energy is needed to break the bonds. Why can't they conduct as a solid? There's a strong electrostatic attraction between the anion and cation, so the ions are not free to move. They can't pass on a charge. And then why can they conduct when molten? Because those ions are free to move. You've broken that electrostatic attraction, so they are free to move. And that brings this revision summary video to an end. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.